This is Jonathan Agilf here for Pro Boxing Fans. We're here at the Churchill Boxing Gym in London. Delighted to be joined by Clar Clarissa Shields, undisputed middleweight champion, three-weight world champion. What are you doing in London? Welcome to London. So for London, I had a woke camp, and it's where I just teach people who show up um, how to box, teach them basic boxing fundamentals and put them through a two-hour class for $50, $50 a session and they learn so much within two hours and come back the next day because they had so much fun here. So is it, you're teaching kids, is it? Teaching boxing skills um, to them? It's, it's just not kids. It's from ages eight till 50, 60. I had the oldest person come to the class was 50, 50, 55. So um, it's been male and female. We've had more, we had more male than female come to the classes to learn from the Guo Camp. And, um, it, it's been great. Today was the last day. I've been here all week. Probably the last interview, so I appreciate you doing it. Um, how have you found sort of the reaction in London? Um, we saw it in Vegas. You got a very good reception. How have you found it here in London? Not your first time here. No, it's not my first time here. I won, won my first Olympic gold medal here. Um, I knew that I had fans in London and I hadn't, you know, made time to see them or sign autographs or take pictures because I'm never over here. So um, this time while I was here, I made sure I tried to bounce around a few different places, show my face in places, and um, just not starve my starve my UK fans. And um, it's been a great experience. I've been busy, busy, busy. Yeah. But um, it's been fun, I, I, and I knew that I I knew that I had fans over here. So that's why I came and did the camp over here. And like I said, it turned out great. Does it feel kind of um, historic? Obviously, you said you obviously you won the Olympic gold medal here. So like coming back must bring all those memories back. No. no? <laughs> <laughs> in 20, 2012, I was 17, so I really didn't get to see much of much of England, and uh, I kind of just had to stay in the Olympic Training Village. And everybody, anytime I went anywhere, it was like Earl Spence holding my hand, Marcus Brown holding my hand, making sure I was safe and taking care of me. So um, I really didn't get to do anything that I wanted to do or do any traveling. It was more of like just focus on boxing and stuff like that. Last time I saw you was two weeks ago, I think now, um, in Las Vegas for Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury. Um, talk to me about how that fight went. I know you're quite close with Deontay. Obviously, didn't go his way on the night. Um, what did you make of the performance? Well, one, it wasn't the Deontay Wilder that I know. He looked drained. He looked tired. I mean, he didn't look strong. Uh, on the opposite end, Tyson Fury did a did a great job. I say in all my interviews, the first knockdown came from from a behind the head shot. It's true. It's on camera. And uh, Deontay Water wasn't able to recover from that, but he made it back to the end of the round, had a minute to recover, and Tyson Fury just came and he had like some good tactics. You know, he choked him some time, put him in hell out. He, um, he went to the body, he had a good jab to the body into the head. Tyson Fury brought a whole different game plan for the fight, so congrats to him. I mean, you said it wasn't sort of the De Deontay Wilder that you knew, you knew. Why do you think that was? It can be from a lot of things. I mean, he said the suit, that probably played a small part in it, but I will say that, you know, just the whole fight week. I was in Vegas from Thursday, to from Wednesday till Saturday, and every day him and Fury had, they had a media every day, day of the weigh-ins, day before the weigh-ins, you know. So much stuff that they had to do that wasn't shown on camera. And um, that can be that can be draining in itself, you know. So I just think that um, that, that kind of bothered him. I mean, Deontay came in a bit heavier than we've seen him. I think career career heaviest. In hindsight, now was that you know too heavy for Deontay to come in at? Oh, yeah, I'm not to say. I think it's only 10 pounds, I believe, or 15. But um, I don't know. I just know that he didn't look, 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 like, look like himself. I'm not going to say that the weight did it. I don't really know. It's a, it, I feel like it was a combination of things. I'm not really sure. How much do you want to see a third fight, and how would a third fight play out? Um, a third fight, I'm going to roll with Deontay Wilder. I feel like he's going to fix all his mistakes and come in better, stronger. And um, just try to get Tyson Fury out of there fast because you know that Tyson Fury is the better boxer. I think he had to go in there and um, apply that pressure first round to probably the 12th, but he has to be the one to start the party. And he got to start dropping Tyson Fury soon. Can't, you can't let Tyson Fury get his rhythm and get that confidence. 
Because if he does, it could be uh, a draw like it was the first time, or he can get the W again. So, so Tyson, look, Deontay Wilder got to start early. I mean, uh, I mean, going into sort of the fight, a lot of people said Deontay Wilder by KO or Tyson Fury on points. Um, you obviously mentioned sort of the shot which knocked Deontay down. Um, I mean, how would he have to sort of approach? Is it more mental, sort of more about the mental game this time around? Because he did land a couple of shots early on and Tyson did take the shots. But is it sort of the, a, a mindset change going into, say, a third fight? Definitely had to be a mindset change, but also had to be like a different game plan change and being focused all the way up to the fight, especially fight week. Like you may have to cut back the interviews, make sure you focus on eating, you know, have a better uniform where it's not 50, 40 pounds. Everybody said that it was an excuse, but his dressing room was in the basement. He got to walk upstairs with 40 pounds on. Tyson Fury had two walkout songs that were like 10 minutes long. So he's standing there. You know what I mean? It's a lot that goes on with with that, but I feel like it was partially small bit of the soup, but just a lot of like the whole week of fight camp. Like, like the whole week. I mean, he was in he was in Miami during the Super Bowl weekend. He's in camp doing interviews, promote, promoting a fight. I would have never done that. I'm not. I don't. I don't leave camp when I'm in camp to go do anywhere, especially to do something for media. I don't do it because camp is what's important. The fight camp, the fight is important. You can't blame. Oh the suit or the interviews or not eating. You have to cut out all that stuff so you don't have, you know, nothing to blame but just say, hey, I wasn't ready. And I think that's why Deontay Wilder wants a third fight because he know that that wasn't himself. It's not about him not being able to. People can accept defeat if, if defeat came at, if, if defeat came and they were 100%. He wasn't 100%. That's why he wants the immediate rematch and he wants to prove himself. That said, did you agree with the decision to throw in the towel? Yes. I, it's really hard because it's like he was getting beat up the whole fight. And it's like he didn't have no legs, he didn't have no power. But, you know, everybody say, oh, one more shot or two more shots, blah, blah, blah. But I think, you know, Mark really knows Deontay Wilder the best, and he made the right decision. And he did it for his safety. And I know we all want to go, me, myself, I want to go down on my, on my shield and everything too, but um, I think if the rep isn't protecting a fighter, it's the coach's job to be the secondary man to do that. And I think Mark Breland, he did, he did that. Um, but, no, but, but no fighter wants to have the towel thrown in. No fighter. I mean, what, what were your emotions ringside seeing what was unfolding in, in the MGM? Uh, I mean, I was, I was sad for Deontay Wilder. Um, but also, too, like, you can't not like the comeback story of Tyson Fury. You know what I'm saying? Like, one of the best comeback stories in the history of boxing. So, um, I still want Deontay Wilder to win. I want him to win the next fight. I want him to do, to do a lot better. But it was like, I wasn't, like, you know, sad where I was, like, crying or crying or anything. I was more just like, dang, I wish, you know, Wilder would have brung more. You know, he just wasn't the Wilder that I know for that fight. Just moving on to you, um, I've seen a lot, I mean, especially during fight week um, surrounding you, Layla Ali. Talk me through sort of where this sort of um, exchange started between you two. It started because Layla Ali is a hater. That's it. It had nothing to do with uh, nothing but her being a hater and her being, you know, envious of my success and what I've done for women's boxing. And she feels like she deserves that credit because everybody kind of give it to me now. Like, oh, you know, she won Olympics. She's the first woman to fight on Showtime and Event Premium Cable. And I think that she's like, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a Ali daughter and I boxed before her and I'm 24 and over 21 knockouts. And she kind of, you know, want people to keep acknowledging her. But her time is over with. They're not going to acknowledge her like that anymore. I, even I acknowledge her, but that wasn't enough for her. She wants to shine. She wants to be known as the greatest woman of all time and um, she's Muhammad Ali's daughter he's the greatest she's just his daughter and as far as skill wise she can't box like me and her accomplishments aren't as great as mine also so I think that that kind of bothers her to the point that now she's like she want to come out of retirement and want to knock me out and beat me up and all this other stuff and it's like she make a big mistake doing that I want I want her to come out of retirement to try to fight me because 
she's going to get more than what she asked for. I mean, how realistic is it? I mean, she's been out of the ring 13 years. Have you held any sort of discussions at all? Our teams have talked to each other. I haven't talked to Layla Ali. Um, is there any update from that? Huh? Is there any update from the discussions? I mean, just more of like trying to find the money that she wanted, the money that I wanted, and uh, make it a fight happen. But she hasn't even come out of retirement yet. So... I mean, that's awesome quotes where you said uh, she wants $5 million. Um, you said the money is is there. So, you know, is there any chance this fight happens in 2020? I have no idea. I mean, do I want it to happen? Yes. But it's still, like, other stuff, too. Like, with the fight one, that's a market that women's boxing has never touched. She made, the most she made in the fight was 600000 So it's like you come and come out of retirement 13 years later, and the market has changed because I'm 10 and 0 and I'm making 400000 a fight now. And it's like, but you were 24 and 0 and you made six. So I'm close to her number already, but it's like, no, no woman has touched a million dollars for price yet. So how can she come and ask for five million? Like, hey, I want us to make money too, of course. But it's like, women's boxing just isn't in that, in that market just yet. But me and her fight can make it surpass that but we just have to figure out the numbers and get whoever it is going to put up the money that they have to be comfortable with the numbers. So I'm not really sure about any of that. Um, I'm going to worry about my next fight come May. And uh, just today you announced Katie Taylor's going to fight Amanda Serrano, seven-weight world champion. Um, how do you see that fight going? And it is a massive fight for women's boxing. It's a great fight. I'm going to roll with Amanda Serrano 60-40 um, because they're both great fighters. They're both good. I just think Katie has problems with pressure fighters. But other than that, and Amanda Serrano can also bang, but she can box also. So I look forward to seeing like what she actually brings to the table with Katie Taylor. But Katie Taylor is definitely faster than her. I just don't know where her strength is going to be keeping Amanda Serrano off of her. Final one, um, as we're in the UK, I've mentioned this to you before, but the possibility of a rematch with Savannah Marshall. Rematch with me. From the amateurs to the pro game. So um, you don't have a rematch from the amateurs to the pros. Let's just get it out of the way. In the, in, in, the, in the pros, I'm undefeated. In the amateurs, I was 77 and 1. In the amateur, Savannah Marshall was probably 120 losses. So that when people talk about me and her fighting, it's like, she has underperformed in every tournament that me and her have been in together. I have four gold medals from the, from the amateurs. Two from the Worlds, two from both Olympics. 2012, 16, she was there both times. The Worlds, she was there both times. You think with, and now I'm a nine time world champion, three divisions, and we've already talked to Frank and we've already had our words with Peter and we told Peter we wanted to fight Savannah Marshall last year. You want to fight her this year. But she didn't have anything going on. She's not known over here. So it's like, what's the benefit of me fighting her? Like, I want, I told her and them that I will fight Savannah Marshall over here. Because she constantly says, oh, she'll beat me again, she'll beat me again. It's crazy how a person can try to, try, try, try to live off of a win that happened seven years ago. Wait, se seven years ago, about to be eight. So it's like, you have, it's a point to where it can't be acceptable for her to, just, her, her to just keep saying, oh, I'm the only person to beat Clarissa Shields. You beat me in the amateurs when I was 17. I'm 24. And I, I won everything after that. And she hasn't won nothing. Then you start acknowledging the girls who beat her. She lost to 20 people. Acknowledge those girls. I'm not going to keep helping her build her resume, and she won't fight anybody. Like, out of all the weight classes she go to, she go to 175 to fight for a world title. When there's champions at 168, I'm undisputed at 160, and I have two belts at 54. She chooses to go up to 175 to get a belt. Like, look at who's ducking who. It's not me. I already told her I wanted to fight her. She didn't want to keep saying, oh, I'm gonna fight her next year, I'm gonna fight her. Peter Fury told us he wouldn't let her fight, fight me till she had 16 fights. She only had three fights in her first two years being a pro. How long do you think I'm gonna wait on her? I'm not gonna wait on her but I'm also not gonna let her keep using my name to build herself up and she's not fighting anybody in the pros. I mean, I fought against girls who are undefeated, reigning world champions, former champions with one loss, girls who've been champions in two different weight divisions. 
I'm fighting against those kind of girls, and she's fighting against girls, so she's calling on two-day notices and knocking them out in day one because they have jet lag. Like, she's not she's not comparable to me. Me and Savannah Marshall names should not be in the same sentence in the pros. And the amateur is over with, so our name should be in the same sentence until she gets an actual world title. And there's not even three girls that fight at 175 pounds. She needs to come back down to 70 to 68, where there's decent challenges where you have Franchon Cruz, Alicia Napoleon, um, Ellen Aceteros. You have world champions at 68. I'm undisputed at 160. You have a load of girls at 160 she can fight against. And I'm also champion at 154. She's at the weight class that has the, has the least girls trying to go for a world title. Savannah Marshall on my level, period. And she knows that. And if she ever want to fight, I'm a smoker. Bad. Finally, when are you next out? I'm next out May 9th, showtime. And the opponent will be announced next week because I can't announce it yet. Great stuff. Caressa Shields, thanks very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your time in London. Yes. And uh, yeah, I appreciate your time for pro boxing fans. Thank you. No problem.